Now, writing this book, Jack, these are this is you, this is your life, this is what you were involved in. You you've recorded the last five years. When you were doing when you were doing the book, did you come to any new revelations? Was there something that stood out to you that that maybe we hadn't realized in our day to day engagement with Antifa, whether it was face to face, online, all over the place, all over the country? Was there something that you learned? You did doing this book that gave you is giving you any new insights into into how to manage this menace this domestic international terrorist group. Well, you know actually. it's it's interesting because a lot of people said they and even my publishers at one point and um Harry Stein from uh City the associate editor at City Journal he came in and served as the editor for the book so I'm really grateful to him and uh, he's got his own book coming out as well right now from Calamo but one thing that we wrestled with was how much history do we want to put in do we want it to be all history or you know do we want it to just be current events and i'm going through like the open court cases and stuff that's going on just in those five years and i argued for putting the history in because i think what's one thing that's very interesting about this is that antifa seems to happen in cycles and it seems to happen in waves. Um, so we see this in the early, you know, the early 1900s, late 1800s, uh, the assassination of McKinley. We then see in the 1920s, 1930s in, in Weimar, Germany. Uh, we see this in then the 60s, 70s, and 80s, again, in West Germany with the rise of the Red Army faction. They're funded by the Stasi and the KGB. They're involved with the, the PLO, the Palestinians. Then they go kind of dormant for a while. They pop up again. 1999 Battle of Seattle, they're anti-China, by the way, at the, at the Battle of Seattle. They're arguing right. against the protest against the WTO and China's ascension. Fast forward 2011, right? 2011, boom, Occupy Wall Street, Zuccotti Park, 99%, 1%. We all remember it. Then you fast forward to now and they're back, but it seems as though they've kind of lost their original roots and they've almost been co-opted by this new ideology that's being pushed by it you know at first some you know just closeted smaller sectors of uh, academia harvard princeton and others but now has burst onto the stage in terms of mainstream america and that is your critical race theory that is your neo-marxism that's your your social justice your racial justice all of this stuff has just blown, uh, absolutely blown sky high, right? Through the roof onto the American scene. The American system does not know how to deal with it, doesn't know how to handle it. And it's this huge struggle now between sort of the morals of the past, traditional American morals, traditional Western morals, and this new type of moral formation that's being pushed by these. And so Antifa though, interestingly, of the you know the current age the modern age has moved away from that economic question and they're talking about culture questions they're talking about racial questions identity questions social questions however what's interesting is that they're actually being driven by economic factors only this time around instead of being used by the Soviet Union, instead of being used by uh, the KGB, they're being co-opted by who? Corporate America, woke academia, the forces of the new regime. And so it's very, very interesting. It's quite nefarious. Uh, and I call this sort of um, hodgepodge of groups that are behind them, at this cornucopia of corruption to just sort of cut across that for people. And so that folks know that they are not fighting the system anymore. Antifa today are the shock troops of mm -hmm. the system. Indeed, they are. And in the past, subcultures that get co-opted by the corporate structure tend to be on their last legs. That is the moment at which you know that an underground phenomenon that had a lot of cool fact, not that Antifa is cool, but just the way the co-option process usually works. Underground phenomenon, it's cool. It starts to trickle up and then it goes a little bit. And then the corporations finally get it. They co-opt it. They own it. And then it's dead. And then it's dead. But that's well, not what's like punk music. Like it's like punk music and the trajectory of Billy Joe Armstrong and Green Day's career, right? <laughs> yeah, you right. know, they they burst onto the scene um, with their first two albums. What is it, Kerplunk and uh, Thousand One Stoned Out Smoky Hours? 
and then or they have backwards kerplunk was second and then they're and they're just totally punk just in the streets boom they go to dookie they go to longview uh nimrod and then suddenly they just become more and more corporate to the point where it's 2004 and they're performing for and dave grohl did this too by the way um obviously famous from you know being the drummer nirvana the foo fighters you know and they're performing at the dnc or you know going on shows with john kerry who's an elected politician you know elected um they're trying to be an elected politician just senator and i remember actually you know looking at that saying what's going on like i thought you guys were musicians why are you getting into this stuff why are you going so corporate and i remember you know fast forward a little bit but do you remember the juggalo march that happened uh in dc a couple of years ago yeah yeah Thank so you. i go to the juggalo march that's the same clown posse and they were actually protesting right the fbi because the fbi was trying to label them like a hate group and label them a criminal gang and all this other stuff and i thought it was really interesting because hey here's a, a subculture that's protesting the fbi but they really haven't allowed themselves to be corporatized or being taken over from that. And that's because of their sort of top-down approach to things uh, in terms of the way they kind of govern all that. And it was really interesting to me because Antifa actually shows up there and they start trying to recruit people. And, and at first the juggalo was like, whatever, whatever, you're just marching with us. But then Antifa was out there in force. It's this DC Antifa, then a bunch of personalities that I'm sure you remember. Mm. And and then as it got throughout the day, Antifa actually got thrown out by the Juggalos because they kept trying to politicize things. And the jug and the Antifa kept saying, well, you know, we just hate Trump so much. We we hate him. He's terrible. He's awful. And the Juggalos would turn on and say, no, you don't understand. From our perspective, it's F all politicians and all politics. Like we, we don't want to play your little games. So if you're going to be like that, get out. Get out. Uh, we had a very interesting super chat already from Eliza right now. She says, how do you expect Antifa to upgrade this summer? What is going to be different? Are they going to have different tactics? Are they going to take a different approach? And she says something about today's sentencing of Derek Chauvin. Is that right? Is that happening today? It is uh, suspected to happen today in in Minneapolis. So they did announce already that the judge, as as to be expected, um, did reject his uh, plea for a, a, a retrial. Uh, one of the stories that I broke um, while I was still at One American News was that this juror um, who came out publicly during the trial was giving interviews from everyone to the Wall Street Journal to NBC, actually had not on his Facebook page, but on his uncle's Facebook page, his uncle had posted a photo of him attending, we were just talking about marches in DC, attending not only the George Floyd march um, that was held by al sharpton but he's got a george floyd shirt on he's got a george floyd hat on um and he's out there protesting against all the stuff george floyd's brother is speaking at the event so he lied all over his jury form mm -hmm. now the judge in that in that case people say well hold on that's that's obviously a grossly biased jury you can't have and if one person on there has that bias he's hidden it uh he's gotten all the way up you know, how do we how do we allow this to go on? Right. But the judge also lives in the real world. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't get that you can't just go off of the letter of the law. You have to understand which way the winds are blowing. And I remember your appearance on Tim Pool following January 6th, which, you know, you also kind of alluded to the same time. You have to know you have to know what point of the movie you're in, folks. You have to know where you are. You have to know how things are going to go over. So that judge, look, he has a career ahead of him. He knows that people are looking at him. He wants to get on to the next rung up the corporate ladder, so to speak, in terms of the, of the, you know, the judicial world. So he wants to go up to be on the appellate court, maybe get on Supreme Court of Minnesota, whatever it is. So he's not going to admit that he did something wrong because it's going to gum up the works of the way things are moving in the machine, the way things are moving in the system. And Alan Dershowitz actually brought this up on court TV weeks ago, where he said, because this case has been so politicized and that our country has become so politicized that he doesn't think that any of the appeals, those will move now to appeal process, that any of those appeals will be heard until you get to the Supreme Court because of the careerism aspect of this and because of the over politicization of this case that maybe, maybe 
the Supreme Court will be the only, you know, the only rung, the, the highest tier of our judiciary in the country where you may be able to find some modicum of relief. Hmm. Well, that's going to be some time before they get to that. And in the meantime, Antifa is going to be still doing their thing. We saw but they have last, a free hand right now. They have yeah. an absolute free hand. So we saw last summer, we saw the escalation from the streets. We saw the escalation in, in, uh, in Portland. And especially we saw the escalation with their coordinated assassination. Uh, of Jay in there in in, a, in the end of the summer last year. And that was a real scary moment, seeing the way that their team operated in the street together, people in front of the target, people behind the target, moving ahead and around them, having people look out, having people filming it. It was terrifying to see a coordinated assassination in the street like that. So when what can I, we expect when I moving about... forward, man? When I talk about this and I talk about the planning that we see in terms of the black blocks and the planning that I witnessed when I was infiltrating the groups in DC all the way back in 2016 to the more sophistication that we now see in the streets, when it comes to a city like Portland, where those individuals were able to be out there night after night after night, right? They're learning best practices. Every time you um, every time you effectively defeat right your opponent, you are revealing a capability. You are revealing a strategy, and that's not just with you know policing. That's that's life, right? So you're revealing a strategy. So because they've gone up against Portland police, they, because they've gone up uh, against the citizens of Portland, the people of Portland for so long, and been allowed to get away with it. Right. We're now learning more about why that was. I talk about that in my book. Now there's new reports coming out that General Milley actually allowed Antifa and these groups to continue their violence across the United States for their for all of 2020. That because they're learning, they're able to then evolve their tactics. 